But good afternoon, everybody. I hope good afternoon, have Marilyn. I just want to add one more thing, like what Karen was saying when somebody complains that we're so strict. Mm -hmm. I want to uh, say that I throw you and Mitch under the bus all the time. I exactly. Just, <laughs> when, when it gets right down to it, I just like my compliance officer is going to have my head if I don't do this. You know, we have to do it, you know, and I will not clear compliance if. I don't do this. I just throw you under the bus all the time. That's exactly it, Dilsey. I use them yes. as a scapegoat because instead of arguing with them, I just say, hey, I'm sorry, my compliance requires this and we have to do it this way and th to make them do it the right way. On the dollar sign, though, I actually ask them because it's, I said, when you just say all fees and you haven't revealed to me all the fees, what are you asking my client to pay? Mm -hmm. I just want to know. Yep. I'll fill it in correctly. So I'm really big about these dollar signs. It's not words. It's numbers. Yes, and that comes are. from you and Mitch. <laughs> yep. Very much so. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. We're going to get started here. This is a very important um, topic. We're not going to spend, you know, hours on it, but we are going to make sure that we make a conscious effort. Um, to stop and think about fair housing in light of April being Fair Housing Month. But before we get started on that, I want to tell you about the update for the Broker Lawyer Committee. And then you're going to take a, a quiz that I made up and then another quiz that uh, NER had. Uh, it's still valid, even though it's an older quiz. And then we'll just talk about a couple of points. And I've given you some handouts because they're all still relevant. And we still have issues regarding all of those handouts, not clarity on the part either of the landlord or the tenant on something like that. But for right now, I'm going to talk to you about the Broker Lorry Committee. And you can certainly um, ask me any questions that you want. Um, that meeting, that was um, earlier, it was like April 12th. It was a Friday. And um, what was interesting about it is the Broker Law Committee are the committee members that make up the changes or additional forms. The TREC will be sent based on the approval, and then the TREC commissioners all meet, and then they decide to approve it, right? And then it comes down to us for using it, right? So that process goes on. And, and during that process, I know I reviewed with you all the changes that they were um, recommending. And then when this class action lawsuit happened, they just put everything on hold. Right. So what happened in April, um, the Trek Commissioner and one of the um, uh, persons on the Trek Commission, not the Broker Lawyer Committee, but the Trek Commission is Lee York. And Lee York happens to be, um, she's risen in the ranks at Texas Realtors at NAR. And I've talked to you about her several years ago uh, when we changed the Code of Ethics because she was sitting on the national committee at that time regarding the changes to article 10-5, uh, those standards of practice. But anyway, here's what happened. When the attorneys are all start to talk about the various forms and the feedback that we've given them, right? That's what they cover during those broker lower committees. They address all the comments that are made by um, agents and realtors all over the state and brokers. It, it was apparent that they had very little respect for the fact that we are entitled to compensation. And the reason, it, it, at first I was taken back and I thought, well, why is that attorney even saying that? And, and the problem is TREC Broker Lawyer Committee looks at the contract forms to be in compliance with what the law is, right? That's what their job and their duty is to make sure that the provisions of the law are found in our contract forms that apply to transactions. Um, and it was obvious by the comments about um, the agents and brokers writing in, you know, we need something like this to do and all these different things. Um, and Lee York, she piped up and she said, um, I think she said, no di disrespect, but I'm quite offended by all of you because every last one of you on your committee, you wanna get paid 
And so we really need to spend quality time discussing this. And that was in particular about the broker's fee is in paragraph eight of our contract. It says it's in a separate form. The information page on page 10 is just information. It's not a ratification as you'll find in other um, con another contract form like the farm and ranch contract form. And so they decided to have a task force because they they could tell they were going to get pushback that somebody's going to determine the best format um, for us being transparent and following all the class action lawsuit settlement agreements and especially in light of what NAR had done. And so they, they created a task force that's going to review this. Now, the reason I'm saying that they posted on the Trek website comments asking, what do you find, what is the most important thing that you want them to talk about, right, and review? Do you want it like the compensation that's covered on the ratification of fees, like it is in the farm and ranch contract? Because once um, NAR meets in next week, they're gonna change the MLS rules. Right. And then probably will go into effect sometime they think by August that NAR will have the MLS rules throughout the place. The settlement agreement is still looking at a little bit later in uh, what will happen. So we still have several months, but it's real critical that you do respond to that. Now I'm going to tell you why. Uh, we are being hit with agents doing the craziest things right now. And the broker lawyer committee, some of the brokers on there mentioned about what they're finding attached to their clients contracts and their offers, right? They were saying agents are attaching the registration agreement and they're trying to say the buyer's agent saying to the listing agent and seller, if you don't agree to this registration agreement, we withdraw our offer, all these crazy things. Nothing has changed right now, okay? So it's business as usual. And we've all discussed um, how it's done. The commercial world is not all upset by this because they've lived their life having it embedded in the commercial contract and about uh, compensation. And Trek could care less about the commercial contracts. They don't have anything to do with um, our private agreements and that. So Texas Realtors, Lori Levy, she talked about it and recommended certain things that are done. Um, the task force that they have right now um, at Texas Realtors is, is waiting for Trek to determine, are they gonna attach an addendum to the contract? Are they gonna embed it in the contract? So a lot of things are not certain on what which way they're gonna go. But I really implore you to send in your, what you think of it should be done. What would be the best and easiest way for all parties, right? On something like this. Because part of that ending our settlement says that before you even show a property, you have to have a signed by our tenant agreement. Marilyn. Yes. To me, the, the main people this is going to affect and hurt is going to be the low income people, the ones that we negotiate with down payment assistance, uh, the ones that we have to request the seller to contribute to our closing costs, they're the ones who are going to be hurting for this if they don't, if we don't find a workaround for our clients. Most of my clients are regular uh, buyers. They're under 400 uh, price range, 400K. So those, just about every one of my clients, every other client, every other client I get seller's contribution or down payments or something to help them. So those are the ones I feel is going to be most hurt by this if we don't find a workaround. I, I do as well. And and the broker lawyer committee talked about making sure everything was transparent. No problem. Our forms have always been transparent, but not per se in the contract, right? Or uh, in anything that is attached to the contract, like uh, the broker information. Uh, my big concern is... Uh, We've been told by the lenders um, and the broker lawyer committee talked a little bit, the VA is not going to change their policy. <laughs> so kind of don't hold your breath for that. And in the state of this great state of Texas, I live right next near San Antonio. That's USA military town. Let me tell you, 
we everybody comes to Texas to retire in the military because Texas gives so many more benefits to those retirees. So um, I am hoping that uh, common sense will prevail truly, uh, something real clear, easy, that um, buyers are not going to be penalized because the buyer's agent is trying to find out Will compensation be given to, you know, so I can represent you and carry on our business? We're fiduciaries, uh, but we're, we deserve to be paid. We are a professional, just like that broker lawyer committee. They're all professionals. You think those attorneys are not going to be paid? So um, I really want them to be respectful and take the time necessary, just like you said, Delcy, make it where it's simple, <laughs> clear cut, and transparent. And we don't yeah. discriminate against those that might be marginal purchasers that need really more help than others. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So uh, I encourage you to please, um, you know, give your feedback on something like that. It just, as I said, it saddened me. Um, Lee York was right. She was offended. I, I, it saddened me that the broker lawyer committee had not already been in several meetings discussing a lot of things between themselves mm -hmm. before they approached it anyway. So we can just only hope that we will um, get a little bit more um, result oriented that will really help us with our industry because you're right. There are, you don't think those buyers and sellers don't need us? Absolutely. absolutely. They absolutely do. And I don't know about you, but I always took, and I do take my fiduciary duty very seriously as all of Absolutely. you. Yeah. On something like that. So uh, don't lose the faith. Let me tell you, they, they think they can count us out, but they can't. We might have to redo a process or learn new ways, but bottom line is uh, all parties need representation in the real estate transaction. And what I think is kind of funny is when agents represent themselves, yeah. Just it's just like what they said, doctor trying to represent them, well, uh, the doctor I'm himself. You know? Oh my word, you really needed more help than the other party on something like that. But yeah. don't lose the faith. Just uh, do we always have to shift and do th certain things? Any of you who've gone through life, I mean, we always have to step back. I remember Mark, everybody know who Mark Willis is? Okay. Well, in 1996, Mark Willis sat on the opposite side of my desk. In my office, I had a little satellite office from the other brokerage, and he he just drew some numbers on a piece of paper and, you know, explained to me overnight. My life changed dramatically for the business I was in. He opened the doorway. I've been with Keller Williams since 1996, and if you think I could find something better to go to, do you think I would have already done that? Mm. Yeah, I would have. Because when I left the other brokerage, I was looking for something much better. I was horrified that the real estate industry in the traditional mode was so punitive to my business. We paid them the privilege, right? And Keller Williams was very respectful of that. And as I said, um, so everybody... Uh, hang in there. Will we learn new scripts and new ways to present information? Yeah, and I'm going to talk about that next month, uh, too, for all of us. Okay? All right. All right. Everybody promise me you're going to be positive, right? Okay. 100%. Good. All right. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take a little quiz. We'll start it out, right? Okay, let's see. Where is my quiz? So as I go through this, all of you either have to respond yes or no, okay? All right. This is a question that will preface everything I'm going to talk about. Is it illegal discrimination to take any of the following actions because of race, color, religion, sex, including gender identity and sexual orientation, disability, familial status, or national origin on the following? First one, refuse to rent or sell housing. Yes. 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 Sorry. Uh, yes. Yes. Refuse to negotiate for housing. Yes. 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 Otherwise, make housing unavailable. Yes. 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 Set different terms, conditions, or privileges for sale or rental of a dwelling. 
Yes. yes. Yeah, that's why we like the landlord's rental criteria to be in writing and done well. Provide a person different housing services or facilities. Yes. Yes. Yeah, false, falsely deny that housing is available for inspection, sale, or rental. Yes. 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 Make, print, or publish any notice statement or advertisement with respect to the sale or rental of a dwelling that indicates any preference, limitation, or discrimination. Yes. 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 Impose different sales prices or rental charges for the sale or rental of a dwelling. Yes. 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 Different Somebody need to mute their thing. <laughs> Thank you, Justin. <laughs> Keeping charges later. They haven't mute. figured it out. Yes. Back if up. you're not taking an exam, please yeah. mute your thing. So that Layla, please communicate with the company to use different qualification criteria or, or applications or sell or rental standards or procedures such as okay. MCARM standards, application requirements, application fees, credit analyses, sale or rental approval procedures, or other requirements. Yes. 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 Evict a tenant or tenant's guest. Wait, what? Uh, yes. If they violated the lease, then there no, that's not. No, uh, we're talking uh -huh. about the clear context of illegal discrimination uh -huh. based on one of the- We can't evict anyone. We can't. We can't do property management. <laughs> if you violate fair housing, <laughs> Har harass a person. Yes, that's that's yeah, right. You can't harass. Yeah. Fail or delay performance of maintenance or repairs. Yes. Yes. Limit privileges, services, or facilities of a dwelling. Yes. 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 Discourage the purchase or rental of a dwelling. Yes. 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 Assign a person to a particular building or neighborhood or section of a building or neighborhood. Yes. Yes. For profit, persuade or <laughs> persuade homeowners to sell their homes by suggesting that people of a particular protected characteristic are about to move into the neighborhood. Yes. 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 Refuse to provide or discriminate in the terms or conditions of homeowners insurance because of race, color, religion, sex, including gender identity and sexual orientation, disability, yes. family, status, yes. national origin, yes. yes. and the occupants of the dwelling. Can I access to or membership in any multiple listing service or real estate brokers organization? Yes. 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 Provide equal service to all. No. 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 I had to throw that in there because y'all. Yeah, like, yes. is this a so double negative you. or is this a double <laughs> negative or what? No, no, no. 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 And no. and we'll talk about equal service when it comes up um, on um, the actual NAR quiz. Some of the following that's on this handout, it'll give particular examples of discrimination. Um, that a person might experience because of sex, including their actual or perceived sexual orientation. And so it, it gives some examples on that uh, basis. But um, we actually um, know that uh, there are situations that occur in the course of our handling it. Uh, but I need to kind of talk about it at this point before we get on with our next test. And here's what the deal is. On the NAR's website for fair housing, they have a simulation called Fair Haven. Have any of y'all done the simulation? No. Oh, no. Well, I encourage you to do it. I, 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 I did last month when it was the fair housing thing, because when you go on heart, it's, it tells you to go on that link for the fair housing. So I, I did it last year, last month. Yeah. Well, um, but this month uh, earlier, I'm sorry. There you go, because the April's for housing. Here's what I'm going to mention in general that's some of the takeaway. I encourage you when you have time to do it. At first, I thought it was going to take a lot longer, and they said you can leave at any time and come back, because very rarely do we all have time to do things like this, right, without interruptions. But the interesting part of one of the um, scenarios is that many times, we are so helpful in understanding what our clients' wants are that we sometimes inadvertently think about what would be best for them, that we impose our thinking of what would be best for them. And uh, that is 
not the way to go. And I think the simulation model uh, had one of them that was very good about that. But I, I think that's where we find it. And even though you didn't purposely, you didn't think you were discriminating, um, it is discrimination because what is the goal? The goal is for your client to tell you what their wants and needs are, not what you think they'll be happiest or best in this area versus another area. Do you know, you see where I'm going on this? That was one of the interesting parts of the simulation is that um, it really brought to light that many times we are not thinking of it's discriminatory, but we're imposing what we think they would be most comfortable in. And that is their determination always and only. Can you give your opinions about a property? Yeah. And, and make sure it's related to characteristics, features of the property, right? Um, I, I can tell you that many times when our clients ask us, well, what do you think? And you really want to tell them, <laughs> I would run from this property. You know what I'm saying? And yet their needs and wants, it's just perfectly done. So you really kind of have to uh, look at it from the prism of your comments are always going to be maybe about features of the property and those type of things. But you're going to be very careful about making sure you don't interject something about, I think you'd feel more comfortable here, that type of thing. Um, and that was interesting because the Fair Haven kind of brought that to light on something like that. Mary, um, I almost stepped into it. One hand. Can you hear me? I almost stepped into it. Okay. I was evaluating or representing the seller uh -huh. and uh, evaluating the buyer's contract. And I looked at the buyer's financials, uh, what he was putting down, you know, that type thing. And I seriously thought to myself, can he afford this house with the pool? The pool itself was about three, four hundred dollars a month with the water and the filters and somebody to clean it and all, all that jazz. But then I had a, a Maryland in my head that said, that's none of your business. You know, that's none of your business. So, but I almost stepped into it. So thank you. Well, you know, as I said, as I went through the simulation, I, I could see all aspects of it. And I could see how we fall into certain things because we're just so used to, do we take care of people? Yeah. All day long, every day. And um, it happens and it, we just have to kind of slow down and, and make sure what we're contemplating on something like that. I'm going to tell you, I, my clients always said, well, Marilyn, what do you think? And of course, they all knew I had some thoughts right, about it. <laughs> <laughs> and so I always had to, you know, guard it and say, well, you know, I want you to come back at three o'clock and look at the traffic and think about your young uh, student driver that's going to have to get out onto 281 uh, at three o'clock. Well, the next day when we met, the father said, well, we did what you said, and we couldn't even get out on the road. <laughs> so then we switched to another area where they felt the, in the entrance and the exit from the development that they were going to live in was much easier for a young driver, a newer driver to Trevor. So a lot of times just kind of think of it in that way um, when you gave your opinion on something like that. Uh, colors never bothered me. Carpeting never bothered me because every <laughs> moment I have ever personally moved into, I have changed all of the floors and changed all the colors. Countertops, you know what I'm saying? So th those kinds of things don't bother me. Um, it might bother our buyers, you know, that don't have the monies uh, at certain points. I remember having to wait to do certain things. And every day when I saw that wallpaper, I kept wanting to just take that one corner and just rip it. But I didn't do it. I had to wait until I could afford to have it removed by a professional. There's some things we just don't do until a professional does it for us. Okay, so now what we're going to do and for some of you who've listened to me for a long time, I've given this quiz over the years, right? But it's kind of good to kind of visit with it. It's the same basis of information, and it's from NAR. The first one says, under federal fair housing laws, it is legal to prohibit which of the following in a housing unit? Somebody answer that. 
B. Smoking. B. Smoking. Smoking and drinking alcohol. No, Both A and C. Okay. Right. They're not protected classes, right? Right. Or protected activities on something like that. Yeah. Which, of the, which of the following are violations or potential violations of the Fair Housing Act? A, B, both, both A, a and B. B. So C, both A and B. Yes, both A and B. Both A and B, right. Under the federal fair housing law, the seven protected classes include, it's B, race, color, religion, sex, yeah, the expansion of sex, a definition, familiar status, handicap, um, age, and national origin. Number four, the fair housing laws prohibit all of the following except evicting a current user of illegal drugs. Yes. That's right. Now, the Civil Rights Act of 1866, some of us were not in real estate at that time, um, <laughs> does which of the following? Grants all citizens the same rights as white citizens to own, purchase, lease, transfer, or use real property. B, allows exemptions only for homes sold without the assistance of a real estate practitioner. C, effectively prohibits all discrimination in real estate based on race. A and C. A and C. A and C. Both A and C, correct. <clears throat> Six, based on federal fair housing law, which of the following people would be protected? A divorced female single parent? A 35-year-old single Jewish man? A 50-year-old white man? And D, all of the above. All of the above. All of the above. Correct. All of the above. Now, number seven, how many of you have read the equal professional service model? Oh, right before I went to bed last night. Okay, good. So in this question, it says the equal professional service model involves all of the following key guidelines except, have I offered a variety of choices? That's what you have to think primary, right? This is what the Fairhaven simulation talks about. Have I offered a variety of choices? Is my client working with another agent? No, that is not a part of the equal professional service model. C, has my customer set the limits? Yes, see, those are the critical formations. And D, do I have objective information? Therein lies, those three elements are so key to us providing equal uh, service to all. Okay, A, when a prospect inquires about the racial makeup of neighborhoods or schools, you should respond by saying B, the Fair Housing Act prohibits me from providing that kind of information. I recommend you contact the school district, municipal government, or the local library, and please get out of my car. <laughs> Woo! And I've told this story before, but I, I used to, um, in my previous brokerage, there was a satellite office in Fair Oaks Ranch, which is a 5,000 acre development. And I live right down the street from the main office, right? And so a lot of buyer prospects would come into the area, right? And they find out that, you know, I live there and that, you know, I love the community and this type of thing. And there was one time where um, the husband asked me if a certain race lived in that neighborhood. And, and I'm driving and I'm thinking, it's a good thing I had a buyer rep agreement for two hours. <laughs> that's, that's exactly what I did when what, I shut two hours. Oh, for wow. two hours. And the reason it was, if I wanted, if I was going to be a good fit for them, that's really my benefit. And it gave them an out because they might've found out I'm not a good fit for them as well. Yes. But what happened was when I, told him that uh, it, the Fair Housing Act prohibited me from even commenting on that. And um, he continued. That determined that he was not going to be a good fit for me. His wife hit him from the back seat. She knocked on him and kind of said, <laughs> no, stop doing that. Because once I said that, the other interesting part is I'm a realtor. I had no life. I knew none of my neighbors. I worked seven days a week. Uh -huh. We do. 
And so some people had the privilege of living in an area for a very long time, but I was new to this area. I'd come back from uh, St. Louis, Missouri, back to Texas. So I really, as I said, most of my life was revolved around real estate and that type of thing. But again, when they persist, it's, it's many times we have landlords that are like that, and we just have to fire them. Yeah. Say, We're just not a good fit for you. Nine, if a seller using a real estate agent refuses an offer because of the buyer's national origin, who may file a federal lawsuit against the seller? Can the prospective buyer? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Real estate practitioner? Yep. The federal government? Yep. Yep. All of yep. it. All, All of, of the above. Mm -hmm. And in Fairhaven's simulation, the, the thing is, is that that's going to be your first response if your client feels they've been discriminated against. And you come back and you tell them certain information. You're going to have the, the link for them to go and file the complaint. That's how we represent the clients that feel they have been um, discriminated against and they are in one of the protected classes. So in paragraph uh, 10, looking at the following four marketing examples, identify which one is okay under article 10 of the code of Eth ethics. Advertising your knowledge of a language other than English. Right, in an English advertisement, yes. right. Absolutely, on something like that. 11, in an advertisement for a small two-bedroom house in the neighborhood where many families live, which of the following language is clearly improper under the Fair, the Fair Housing Act? Family B, C, and D. Well, you would think C and D, but the answer is D, no children. Um, oh. Family-friendly oh. I agree. I don't think I would do that. As I said, mm -hmm. at the very end, I'm going to give you the tips for advertising. Mm -hmm. um, but um, if you're using the terms and it would be excluding other uh -huh. than a family, then it would be a violation. Okay. So um, it, it, huh. has to, it has to be in... Um, that well, what about thing. near playground and senior center? If that's a yeah, fact. that's like almost saying B, C, and D. That's yeah. talking about amenities around the property, which is fine. We want to focus on the features of the properties or amenities around. It doesn't say you have to be a senior citizen <laughs> to gotcha. purchase it. Yeah, but it, it's important to find out those things, especially if oh, oh this where you said is clearly improper. Okay, I yeah. misread it. See, in the others, it just kind of like uh, could be a possible violation. It could be gotcha. a context, something like gotcha. that. 12, which of the following features are required in ground floor units of non-elevator multifamily building of four units or more built after March 1991? An accessible bank uh, building entrance on an accessible route for persons in wheelchairs? Yes. Mm -hmm. Accessible and usable public and common use areas? Mm -hmm. Yes. Light switches, electrical outlets, thermostat, and other environmental controls in accessible locations. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, those all are all of the above. All of the above. Kind of like they've given us a test and all of the above happens to be a lot of response to, to the questions that we have. Marilyn, yes. can you go back to number seven and tell us which one was the correct answer? I thought it was A. Everything except is my client working with another agent. It's all three of us. Mm -hmm. Now we want to know if they're working with another agent, but that's not a part of the equal professional service model. Okay. So now, um, Marilyn. Yes. That part of, you know, who could report and who could do what with, uh, if you feel your client being discriminated against, that happened to me where my client, she was uh, Indian and we kept, we applied to like three, four different houses and I, I may have brought this up 
before on fair housing before. Uh, and we didn't, we kept watching those houses that they kept telling us come back with the highest and best offer. And my client was like, damn, you know, maybe I should change my occupation. She was an engineer. And she was like, maybe I should change my occupation because these houses don't get it hot until she looks at them or until she submitted an offer and she had a very long name. And so blah, blah, blah. Long story short, we ended up buying new construction and we kept watching several of those houses that had told her that they had offers and to come back with our highest and best. She was in our house three months and those houses still had not sold. So we probably should have gone back and turned them in. And you Instead of the, the best uh, thing that we got, she got a better house, lower down payment, brand new house. And that's how she looked at it. You know, it's just like, we weren't going to waste our time with those people any further. But it was several different brokerages that did I that. I know. Too. And it's ultimately their decision. We give them and encourage them to file the complaint, right? And ultimately, it is their decision. What's interesting about what you just said is... There are issues when a listing agent knows that the seller has not responded to an offer based on discrimination. Mm -hmm. And so um, what the gentleman that is one of the investigators for the Civil Rights Division of Texas Workforce, and they're the ones who handle all the HUD fair housing complaints for Texas. What Coop said, and I, Mitch was there too, what Coop said is that the listing agent will be in trouble. You have to commit at that point in time that the reason the seller or the landlord did not respond was not based on discrimination, that there were other factors. The moment you know they're discriminating, what do you have to do? You have to fire them. Yeah. 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 That is, yeah. That is one of them. This gentleman that was um, one of the uh, providers of the seminar that we went to at the winter meetings. Uh, he was quite entertaining. Um, he had had a very interesting career and he was the one, and I told you in previous sessions where he said, just be mm -hmm. considerate, just kind of be kind and considerate. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think over his history of investigating all of these claims, um, he found that there was um, great need for everybody being more kind and considerate. Now, on the Fair Housing Act, I'm going to, um, this is a HUD um, document. It's just so hard to prove, you know, it's hard, it's so hard to prove if it walk like a duck, quack like a duck, it's a duck, but it's still so hard to prove, you know, because people they usually don't have the courage to admit what they're doing. And, you know, so it's sometimes you just have to. Yeah, but that, it is ultimately their decision. Our, our duty would be to tell them, look, if you feel you've been discriminated against, absolutely. You have every right to file a complaint. Here's the details, right? Um, what's interesting is in uh, Fairhaven, um, in one of the simulations, um, it it showed that the buyer felt that the seller was discriminating, but they really found that that house fit their needs. And so they asked their agent to go back. Yeah, and yeah. The agent. And so many times we find a resolution because yes. the individual has said, you know, I'd like to try this and give them a second chance on something like this. Um, and again, um, as a listing agent, we absolutely know if our client is discriminating based upon the protected characteristics. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. And we have to fire them if they are, because sometimes they're not going to change and do the right thing. Now, this housing um, HUD letter is in response to the that growing element of those ESA certificates, emotional support animal certificates that were available online, right? And the reason I had to come out um, and tell that the landlord has rights is because some landlords felt intimidated uh, based upon these ESA certificates. And so they were clearly saying that, you know, this information is not reliable. 
Uh, they feel that those websites took advantage of individuals with disabilities or promoted um, the uh, fraudulent activity of posing as an individual with a disability um, for the service animals. So some of the things I've given you are, are still valid. Uh, they are um, based upon what is, um, you know, um, still going on. What I love is Texas Realtors has a general information for landlords regarding assistance animal. All of that information is valid. That's what we go by on something like that. So this handout from HUD um, talks about fair housing, who's protected, and we just went through that. Uh, what types of housing are covered? And what's interesting is that Fair Housing Act covers most housing, period. But in some circumstances, in some circumstances, the act exempts owner-occupied buildings with no more than four units, single family houses sold or rented by the owner without the use of an agent, and housing operated by religious organizations and private clubs that limit occupancy to members. Okay, so yeah, under very certain extreme conditions, are uh, there certain exemptions? What is prohibited? Well, that was the test that all of y'all scored 100 on earlier today, talking about all of that. So, you know, we really, as I said, um, have a lot of wonderful documentation to help us broaden the knowledge of the people that we represent um, in the course of these transactions. And you really want to make sure that you are armed with all the right documentation, right? Especially that. What I find interesting is that we have more instances where a landlord comes to our agents to lease, list their property for lease, right? And though that landlord doesn't know the beginnings of how to be a landlord. And they're looking to the lease listing agent to actually be the landlord. That mm -hmm. is not our duty. Our fiduciary duty is to procure the ready, willing, and able tenant. It is not to step into the shoes of the landlord. And you could get in serious trouble if you try and do that. Okay, so you've got to be cognizant. If you represent a landlord who doesn't know how to be a landlord, you're probably going to recommend them to a really good property manager. Um, because this is not uh, an easy um, type of transaction if you are incompetent handling the duties of a landlord. Um, the Texas a and Real Estate Center guide that I recommend everybody use is great. It's in Q&A format, but we absolutely have landlords that we represent who don't know anything. Mm -hmm. And they're expecting you to do all that. And that's when you can get into um, serious uh, trouble on those types of situations. So, um, the guideline for advertising, and we kind of had one of those questions uh, in the NAR, it says only advertise the features and amenities of a property. Never advertise who could use the property. If you keep that in mind, you're going to be fine as far as not having any advertisement that would conflict with um, fair housing. Um, Mary, Lynn, Mary Lynn, I have seen sometimes they put no Section 8. Is that discrimination? No. Section 8 is a specialization. The landlord would have to make sure their property is qualified for Section 8. And many landlords are not able to do that. Yeah, that's not discrimination. I'm going to tell you, just I'm glad you brought that up, because we had an instance where a landlord agreed to allow for Section 8, the vouchers that would come, right? The lease commenced. When Section 8 came out to certify the property, they would only certify it if the rent was reduced. And the landlord didn't have a good lease listing agent to advise them, you need to verify all of this before you extend to prospective tenant to be Section 8 housing. Because now that landlord was trapped. They had to lower the rent. So... It's not your not your ability to answer all the questions. It's your you're the source to the source. So that's why you have to make sure that you give really good advice on these types of scenarios for landlords. Um, and it, it's it's just one of those things that 
is critical. And, and what's interesting, folks, talk about proposition value that you bring as a lease listing agent or a tenant agent. That lease document, those 17 pages, if they hired an attorney to write that, mm -hmm. ha, ha, ha. Yeah. if they be uh, less than $5,000, no, it's the same way. Attorneys don't read as fast as you and I do, and they charge by the minute. <laughs> So, I mean, you know, we have so, this kind of leads into what I'm going to talk about next month. Next month, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about, could you please stop doing certain things <laughs> in the course of a transaction? And then I'm going to talk about, and could you please start doing some things in the course of a transaction? Just because we've seen some crazy stuff lately and everybody's gunning for us, period. Big deal. We've got broad shoulders. We can handle this. We're used to pivoting and shifting and all these types of things, but we probably need to touch upon some things just to make sure that we're not involved in something that's going to lead to more of an issue for us. Um, and then I'm going to present to you um, some little helpful points about how you need to look at your value in the transaction. And, um, you know, I came from a, a big corporate background. I worked for big, huge companies. I was in their risk management and design risk management systems and that type of thing. And every 15 minutes that I worked for one of their big clients, I had to have recorded. Because you know what? The company I worked for was charging the client for my services, right? I mean, every 15 minutes, you think I could take two hours off? I don't think so. <laughs> I had to show that I was working, folks. Uh, and that's what it's like uh, with attorneys on fee billing. You know, they bill you in increments of stuff. And so what I just thought it's because you were with a bunch of worked with a bunch of dinglings, and because I record a ton of conversations too with all the dinglings we come in contact with. Yeah. So we just need to understand how we would be presenting our value proposition. And I still remember clients when I would show the sellers my breakdown um, of my expenses, the sellers would say, oh my gosh, why do you do this? I said, because I'm going to need all the referrals you can send me because I have to work on volume. And, and I'll be honest, I don't think we do a very good job demonstrating our value and our worth to some of our clients. Now, some of them, yeah, they do know. And they know you're busy doing stuff. But we do so many things in the background mm -hmm. that our clients aren't aware of, right? So they think this is easy. It's like a magic act. Poof, we found a buyer and we sold, got your you know, property under contract. So um, we need to kind of listen to uh, what we need to be doing and preparing and how we really think of our own self-worth in the course of the services that we deliver um, in, in our real estate transactions. As I said, I really, I don't think a lot of you understand how, your worth. And so it's gonna, until you put it on paper, folks, you don't really see it in the same way uh, so that you can communicate it well to your clients on something like that. And, and I'll give you the hints that I did. And I mean, this is going back when I first was licensed in 1993. I, I was stunned that realtors had all these expenses and yet sellers and buyers think like magic, somebody pays us. <laughs> it, <laughs> it seems like magic sometimes, right? When you have a transaction where you don't have any, mm -hmm. but for the most part, uh, we work really hard to get everybody across the finish line. And that absolutely, and our, my favorite word being funded. Um, we can close to the cows come home, but it funding is the act of we we've been paid, right? And I'm not afraid to say that we should be paid. None of you should be. I think for some of you, it may be a little uncomfortable. How how can I phrase my work, right? And in the beginning, when you first get licensed, you're thinking, well, I don't know anything. How can I say I'm more? Well, you're just going to have to get res resolved on not saying you don't have value because you don't have experience. Now, the more experience you have, 
your value proposition goes way up. Well, folks, it takes time to get there. Years. As I said, I've been licensed since 1993. And um, I was horrified that I got a license, but I didn't know anything. <laughs> Hello. And, and what made even worse is I'd go to all the top producers and I got different answers from all of them. <laughs> That wouldn't work for me either. And I said about making sure that I knew if I said something to my clients, it better be true. And it better be something I know, not what I think. Okay. So we'll we'll kind of touch on that next month as well as some of the things that I'd like to see you be aware of to doing and some things to stop doing on something like that. So any questions from you good people? I left you a message, Marilyn, in the in the chat. Personal oh, message. A personal message. Oh. Yeah. Uh, it's risk we all heard that, Bernard. Marilyn, <laughs> it's risk management at kw.com. That's the Marilyn. only email address I have. Marilyn, okay. what day next month in May are we seeing you? Well, Fourth is the Memorial You're Day. All invited to my house on Memorial Day. No, I'm just. I'll teasing. be there. <laughs> <laughs> um, How long is that drive? I might be there too. I'm following whoever says they'll be there. It's in, it, I'll carpool. I'll, I'll, I'll bring you. Karen, we got a date. Just, we'll see you then, Marilyn. Yeah, there you go. Just come on in. Thank you, I, Marilyn. I have a gate code. <laughs> and you're not giving us a gate code, are you? <laughs> no. My husband's on the board, and the last person who posted that in next door or whatever, oh. man, uh, the, so, they got into serious trouble and have liability because now those codes are out everywhere. And of course, uh, it involved uh, changing all of them. Um, but I'm the, the Monday before Memorial Day, May 20th on our calendar. 20th. There you go. All right. That's. See That's you when then. we're going Bye -bye, to Maryland. All right. Thank Everybody you. take care and I'll see y'all next time. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye